Hey, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Uh, as I mentioned in a video last week, we do now have the Pentium G4560 processor on hand. Uh, and in that video last week, we set out to discover if this processor could still run Windows 7 despite the lack of official support for KB Lake processors. And as expected, we found that yes, it can. The Pentium G4560 features two cores with hyper-threading support enabling four threads. So essentially then it's a Core i3 processor, which I have to admit is a little confusing since we also have KB Lake Core i3 processors with two cores and four threads. Uh, the only difference being that the Pentium models are clocked a little bit lower and use the base 3 megabyte level 3 cache. That's amazing news for budget shoppers who had their eye on something like the Core i3-6100 because the G4560 costs just $72 US or $78 Aussie. That's almost half the price of the i3-6100 down under, a 48% discount for us Aussies. The G4560 really does look to be the bargain CPU of 2017. That said, you will still run into heaps of online users claiming things like the Core i3 processors are garbage for gaming, they're dual core rubbish, and so on. I've always been a bit miffed by this. Our own Core i3 6100T test system, which runs a Skylake i3 processor clocked at just 3.2 GHz, has always proven very capable, getting the most out of budget GPUs such as the RX 470 and GTX 1050 Ti. Personally, I think a lot of these comments have come from people who invested in a Core i5 or even Core i7 processor and don't understand that not everyone can afford to spend that kind of money on a gaming PC. Whatever the case, I do consistently hear from actual Core i3 owners about how impressed they are with the performance of their underrated processors. Admittedly, part of the problem could also be us, the reviewers. Generally speaking, we test CPU gaming performance uh, using the fastest possible GPU available uh, at lower resolutions than you would typically game at. And this is done in order to remove the possibility of a GPU bottleneck, uh, which would shape the results. This is great for showing just how much faster, say, a Core i7 processor is than a Core i3 processor under extreme gaming conditions. However, as a result, it can make the Core i3 processor look significantly slower in comparison than, say, it would under more realistic conditions. Even though in the extreme example just given, the Core i3 might still enable playable performance, the fact that it appears so much slower than the Core i7 leads many to jump to the conclusion that it's not suitable for gaming. To get the full picture, I feel you really need to test CPU gaming performance with a number of different tiered GPUs. So for this video, I will be benchmarking the G4560 along with a few other processors using the GTX 1050 Ti, GTX 1060 and GTX 1080 at both 1080p and 1440p. This will give those sensible folks pairing a budget CPU with a budget GPU a real idea of what to expect. Meanwhile, by including the GTX 1080, you can see what kind of performance a faster processor might enable should you have the GPU power to take advantage of it. Please note, due to the limited pixel real estate, I have been restricted to the number of CPUs I can compare in a single graph before it becomes an incomprehensible mess. So while I have included Core i3, i5 and i7 processors, I'm sure there's an additional processor or processors you would like to have seen included. So for now these samples will have to do, but depending on demand I could create a follow up video featuring other processors. So feel free to drop your requests below in the comment section. Anyway, with all that in mind, let's jump to the results. First up we have Rise of the Tomb Raider, an action adventure title that isn't particularly CPU demanding. As a result, the G4560 had no trouble maxing out the 1050Ti and 1060 at 1080p, delivering the exact same experience as the more expensive processors including the Core i7-6700K. Increasing the rendering power with the GTX 1080 so the average frame rate increased dramatically, though the minimum frame rate when paired with the Pentium processor remained much the same. This resulted in occasional stuttering, and overall I found the experience with the G4560 better using the GTX 1060 than I did with the GTX 1080, so that was interesting. Bumping the resolution up to 1440p, we again find the same experience with the GTX 1050 Ti and GTX 1060, while all four processors tested also delivered similar numbers with the GTX 1080. Now, without quite the same significant variance between the minimum and average frame rates, the gaming experience when using the G4560 was comparable to that of the 6700K. Far Cry Primal is another game that isn't particularly CPU demanding. Testing at 1080p shows similar performance across the board when using the GTX 1050 Ti and 1060. Moving to the GTX 1080, we see that it's really only the Core i5 and Core i7 processors that can push this high-end graphics card to its full potential at 1080p. That said, moving to 1440p, the only thing slowing the G4560 down is that 3.5GHz operating frequency 
as the 4.2 GHz 7350K is able to keep pace with the i5 and i7 models, even when using the GTX 1080. That said, the game was still very playable on the G4560 and we didn't notice any kind of stuttering issues at 1440p. Tom Clancy's The Division was tested using the low-level DX12 API and this should help out the lower-end processors. Despite testing a very demanding section of the game where frame rates are pushed quite low at times, the G4560s seem to hang in there. Performance was much the same with the GTX 1050 Ti, while the Pentium processor was just 9% slower than the 6700K with the GTX 1060. Increasing the resolution to 1440p evened up the 1050 Ti results, and now the G4560 was just 4% slower than the 6700K when paired with the 1060. As you might expect, the budget dual-core processor wasn't able to extract the full potential from the GTX 1080, and here the minimum frame rate was 19% lower when compared to the 6700K result. Hitman was also tested using DirectX 12 and here the G4560 was able to max out the GTX 1050 Ti at 1080p. It fell slightly behind the GTX 1060, trailing the fastest tested CPUs by a 12% margin. The Pentium processor was pretty much maxed out with the 1060 as we saw little improvement with the 1080. Moving to 1440p, the G4560 matched the other three processors when using the GTX 1060, but again fell well behind with the GTX 1080. The minimum frame rate was 20% lower when compared to the 6700K, and the average frame rate was 30% lower. Quantum Break is another game that isn't very CPU demanding, at least in our test, and here the G4560 was able to max out the GTX 1050 Ti. That said, with the GTX 1060 handling the rendering work, it was 14% slower than the 7350K when comparing the minimum frame rate, despite matching the average frame rate of even the 6700K. The GTX 1080 performance was also very respectable, and here the Pentium processor never dipped below 90 frames per second. Increasing the resolution to 1440p saw the G4560 hang in there with the big guns, even with the GTX 1080 installed. Our Overwatch bot match test does use all 8 threads of A6700K, so needless to say this is a very CPU intensive benchmark. Nonetheless, the G4560 pushed the GTX 1050 Ti to its limit, which meant frame rates never dropped below 90 FPS. The Pentium processor also handled the GTX 1060 quite well, and it was the minimum frame rate that was most impressive here. As we've seen time and time again at 1080p, the GTX 1080 proved too much for the budget dual-core processor. Increasing the resolution to 1440p allowed the G4560 to match the i3, i5, and i7 processors when paired with the GTX 1060. Again, it was only when we whipped out the GTX 1080 that the Pentium was exposed as the weaker processor. Doom's low-level Vulkan API lets the G4560 off the hook, and shockingly, even at 1080p, this affordable processor is almost able to push the mighty GTX 1080 to the 200 FPS cap. Needless to say, it had no trouble getting the most out of the GTX 1060 and 1050 Ti. Moving to 1440p, we see the dual-core Pentium hangs in there with the other processors, delivering similar performance even with the GTX 1080. Total War Warhammer might offer low-level API support, but this strategy game is still a seriously heavy CPU user due to the vast amount of units present when heading into battle. The G4560 does well when paired with the GTX 1050 Ti, but falls well behind the 8-ball once we ramp up the rendering power with the GTX 1060. Here it trailed the Core i3-7350K by a 24% margin and the 6700K by 39%. That said, the game was still playable, but you would be wasting a heap of money here, as there was a heap of untapped performance. Placing additional load on the GPU by moving to 1440p helped out the Pentium processor a little, though it still trailed quite a bit with the GTX 1060 when comparing the minimum frame rates. Mirror's Edge Catalyst is surprisingly hard on the CPU. Although the G4560 was able to max out the GTX 1050 Ti, it came up short with the GTX 1060 as the minimum frame rate fell away. By the time we reached the GTX today, the Pentium and Core i3 processors were miles behind the i5 and i7 models. Bumping up the resolution to 1440p helped when paired with the GTX 1060. Now the G4560 was comparable to even the 6700K. F1 2016 is another surprisingly CPU demanding game. As we have seen time and time again, the G4560 is able to extract maximum performance from the GTX. 1050 Ti. However, it does start to fall behind when paired with the 1060 and well behind with the 1080. At 1080p, it was 25% slower than the Core i3-7350K with a minimum frame rate of just 36 FPS, which is essentially the same result it managed with the 1050 Ti. Even at 1440p, the G4560 isn't able to get the most out of the GTX 1060 and falls well behind the Core i5 and i7 processors.
Deus Ex Mankind Divide is another game that is surprisingly CPU demanding. Although the G4560 was able to get the most out of the GTX 1050 Ti, it started to fall behind with the 1060 and well behind with the 1080. The 1440p resolution helped the G4560 catch up when paired with the GTX 1060, though it was still well behind with the GTX 1080, at least when comparing the minimum frame rates. Battlefield 1 is possibly the most significant title we're testing with, and not just because it's hugely popular. The game is a CPU killer, and has had many Core i5 owners scrambling for an upgrade. Before you get the megaphone out shouting we need to test the multiplayer portion of the game, hear me out. Firstly, and very importantly, accurately testing multiplayer performance is near on impossible. For a single test, you can get an idea of what a system is capable of, but then for comparing it to something else, it's just not practical. Secondly, the section of the single player campaign that we use for testing is extremely CPU intensive. In fact, it replicates the multiplayer CPU usage to a T. So the numbers that I'm about to show you should be true for the multiplayer portion of the game as well. At 1080p, the G4560 provided a similar experience to the higher end processors when compared to the GTX 1050 Ti. It does start to fall away quite a bit with the GTX 1060 and then ends up miles behind with the GTX 1080. Something that I found odd was the fact that the G4560 and 7350K actually hit lower minimums with the GTX 1080 than they did with the GTX 1060 in this title. That doesn't seem possible, but these results are based on an average of 6 runs and the GTX 1080 consistently saw lower minimums with these dual core processors. Moving up to 1440p, the G4560 does well again with the GTX 1050 Ti and not too bad with the 1060 this time. Mafia 3 is quite demanding on the CPU, though it's also very much a GPU pig as well. The G4560 once again was able to max out the GTX 1050 Ti, but falls well behind when using the GTX 1060. Here at 1440p, the Pentium processor doesn't do too poorly with the GTX 1060, but of course does fall behind the Core i5 and i7 processors with the GTX 1080 handling the rendering work. Gears of War 4 is a game that loves to gobble up cores, and here we see the result of that. The G4560 does well with the GTX 1050 Ti in charge, but once we move to the 1060 it starts to fall behind. Upping the resolution to 1440p allows the Pentium processor and the 7350K to keep pace with the i5 and i7 processors when using the GTX 1060, though they do fall behind once again when running the GTX 1080. Back when I first tested Titanfall 2's GPU and CPU performance, I found the game wasn't at all demanding, especially on the CPU. This was true for both the single and multiplayer portions of the game. The single player pushed utilization to around 25% with our Core i7 6700K processor, while multiplayer only hit as high as 35%. As a result, you can see that even at 1080p, the G4560 is able to extract maximum performance from the GTX 1060 and 1080 graphics cards. That being the case, we find the exact same thing at 1440p, so not much to see here then. Civilization 6 is the complete polar opposite to Titanfall 2, and that probably isn't surprising as they are in no way similar games. Like most bird's eye view strategy games, Civilization 6 is extremely CPU demanding. Even with the GTX 1050 Ti, we see the G4560 dropping a few frames behind the Core i5 and i7 processors, and this is something we haven't seen in any other game yet. As a result, with the GTX 1060 installed, the G4560 falls well behind even the 7350K. Here it was 21% slower and almost 30% slower than the Core i5 7600K. Oddly, moving to 1440p, the margins actually increase with the GTX 1050 Ti, and frankly, I don't really know how to explain this. In any case, this is clearly a game that requires at least a Core i5 processor to get the most out of it. When it comes to CPU utilization, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare is very similar to Titanfall 2, and when testing the Core i7 67K, we found that CPU utilization hovered around 30% in both the single player and multiplayer portions of the game. So as you might have expected, even at 1080p, the G4560 is able to hang in there with the big boys, even with the GTX 1080 installed. Moving to 1440p further cements this, and here the Pentium processor was indistinguishable to the Core i5 and Core i7 processors. Okay, so that covers all the benchmark results and how to make sense of it all. There are a few ways we could go about this, uh, and the way I've decided to do it is select all the CPU demanding games, uh, then compare the minimum results and show the average figures in a single graph. So for now, let's drop the non-demanding titles, which includes uh, Titanfall 2, Call of Duty, Infinite Warfare, Far Cry Primal, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Quantum Break, and Doom. Uh, that leaves us with 11 games that were CPU demanding and showed noticeable performance drop-offs uh, with the GTX 1060 and GTX 1080 when looking at the minimum frame rates.
So here we have it, the average minimum frame rate for the CPU demanding titles. As you can see, the Pentium G4560 is able to extract the maximum performance from the GTX 1050 Ti. Of course, it won't surprise many of you that a budget CPU is the perfect pairing for a budget GPU. Stepping up to the GTX 1060, we did find mixed results, and if we focus on the CPU demanding titles, we see that the G4560 was 21% slower than the Core i7-6700K, and 17% slower than the 7600K. It also trailed the 7350K by a 10% margin which isn't bad given it's clocked 18% lower. As you can see the G4560 was pretty much tapped out with the 1060 and we only see a 2 FPS boost when moving to the 1080. Whereas the 6700K was 27% faster than the G4560 when gaming with the GTX 1060, it's a whopping 87% faster with the GTX 1080. So, if we only tested with the GTX 1080 at 1080p, it would be easy to assume that gamers really need a Core i7 processor. Bumping the resolution up to 1440p reduced the margins quite dramatically, whereas the 6700K was 27% faster than the G4560 with the GTX 1060, it's now just 18% faster. Of course, those running a high-end GPU such as the GTX 1080 will still want a Core i5 or Core i7 processor. So for that vocal minority that lost their minds when I started testing uh, low-end graphics cards such as the GTX 1050 series and the RX 460 and RX 470 graphics cards using our Core i3 test rig, you can now see why this wasn't such a big deal. Uh, for the vast majority of gamers, the Core i3 can get the most out of these low-end graphics cards or entry-level graphics cards and it does a much better job of representing real-world performance than a $340 US Core i7 processor does. But anyway, that's probably a discussion for another time. Something I noticed and found quite interesting during this extensive test was when and where stuttering reared its ugly head. For the most part, I only noticed stuttering when using the GTX 1080 on the dual-core processors. This could be seen in the results when testing. Benchmarking the G4560 with the GTX 1050 Ti, for example, the results from the three runs were all very much the same. This was also true with the GTX 1060 configuration for the most part. The gameplay was smooth and consistent with no stuttering. Then with the GTX 1080, the minimum frame rates were all over the place in most of the games tested, and in an effort to improve accuracy, some games were run half a dozen times. So again, if we were only benchmark with a high-end GPU such as the GTX 1080, this would lead me to believe that the G4560 is more prone to stuttering. In addition to benchmarking, I did spend quite a bit of time playing the games tested with the G4560 and GTX 1050 Ti combo, and found the experience surprisingly satisfying at 1080p. Again, absolutely no stuttering at all was seen in any of the games tested with the GTX 1050 Ti. Some load level times were a bit extreme, I think the Division was the worst, but other than that it was smooth sailing with the G4560. The G4560 is by far the best processor to come out of this whole KB Lake slash Skylake refresh, and shockingly it's not a processor Intel sent to reviewers. That said, as good as it is, Intel could have just said, you know what guys, we're taking this one off. Here, have a $72 Core i3-6100 and we'll call it a day. That probably wouldn't have sat too well with OEMs trying to flog PCs based on what is meant to be the latest and greatest technology. So, voila, we have the 7th Gen series. Well, that about wraps this one up. I'd just like to quickly say a big thank you to all of you who watch the channel with your ad blocker disabled and use the Amazon affiliate links in the video description. It really helps me out and it enables me to invest the time it takes to create the video comparisons such as this one. Um, and also for those of you who would like to see similar comparisons with a combination of different CPUs or maybe the G4560 compared to other CPUs, then let me know about it in the comments below and I'll see what I can do about making that happen. I'm your host Steve and I'll catch you on the next one.